Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, first of all, hats off to uh, uh, to Pubmatic, standing room only this morning, and that is, that is wonderful to see. Um, having spent 20 years on the publisher side, magazine publisher side, uh, and my entire life in the media, I, I feel like I've lived through uh, the evolution of, of this industry and certainly uh, some of the revolution in it. As I look at the volume and velocity of change our industry is experiencing now, I'm beginning to believe that we are not just witnessing the next phase of the evolutionary process, but we are in fact undergoing a full-blown revolution. There is a fundamental change in power taking place as we speak. Change, especially at this rate, is difficult for anyone to endure but publishers have had a particularly difficult time adjusting to the current trends that replace much of the direct sales model in favor of data-driven automated processes. I too once had a difficult time recalibrating my point of view. There was a time that I glorified the courtship of the traditional model as the only model, expecting any partnership between advertiser and publisher to involve a face-to-face -face relationship. I am also guilty of insisting that any piece of content written by a trained journalist be sheltered and cherished for fear of commoditization. The reality is, times have changed. My name is Wenda and I am a recovering magazine publisher. <laughs> Let me share briefly uh, my journey, as I'm sure you can relate. The first step is admitting that you have a problem. Publishers have had a fear of programmatic, a fear of devaluing premium inventory, of exploiting user data, of creating obsolescence in their sales teams. Whether these fears are real or imagined, the truth is that resistance and denial are no longer an option. Programmatic is a $9.8 billion market. We have no choice but to meet the demands of the industry, collaborate with our clients to achieve their marketing objectives, and inevitably welcome automation. Two, we must recognize a higher power that can give us strength and relevance and higher CPMs. It is clear that by embracing and educating ourselves about how technology can help us, we will successfully strengthen, grow, and innovate our own businesses, allowing ourselves to partake in the revolution rather than be lost in its wake. The next phase, which is what we're going to talk about today, is to learn to live a life with a new code of behavior. And so I invite our panelists on stage now, um, and I'm hoping that we have some chairs for those panelists. So I guess I'll be vamping for the next couple of minutes. Uh, okay, great. Um, so we're gonna be talking this morning about this pivotal point when recovery becomes reinvention and we learn to put these new principles into action. So we have a fantastic panel this morning. I will invite them up to the stage now. Uh, from NBC Universal, we have Christian Batya, EVP, Digital Strategy and Operations. From Bloomberg, we have the global CRO, Paul Kane. And from about.com, we have CEO, Neil Vogel. Welcome, everybody. Okay, so the media business, past, present, future, is characterized by constant reinvention, uh, largely because of, of technology. As I said in my brief remarks, the volume and velocity of change is stunning, and it certainly applies to all of the companies that you work for. So first question, jump ball, uh, anybody, how are our technology trends uh, shaping your strategies uh, and in general, what, what kinds of challenges um, do they pose? All right, I'll take it. Um, so we're, uh, I'm the CEO of about.com, and we're, we're a bit of a different story than um, these guys. I mean, Bloomberg and NBC, they're clearly established as premium publishers. I think um, 
For those of you who don't know, two years ago, a little more than two years ago, IAC uh, bought About.com from the New York Times, and it came out of a period of a pronounced lack of investment. So we ended up with something that had very, very premium content but was not in a premium package. So um, the primary way that uh, About monetized was programmatic, but it was done in like the least efficient way possible. Like they really sucked at it. And um, can, you tell us what, can you really tell us like what you feel? Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> you're, you're not gonna have a problem with me on that, uh, generally speaking. But I think what we've done is over the last uh, 12 to 18 months, I got there 18 months ago, we've rewritten every line of code and we, we, we redesigned our site, put a whole brand new platform, brand new everything, and all of a sudden we look like a premium publisher. So um, that is uninteresting and unrelevant to all you guys, except um, for the fact that we were able to, as like the 16th or 17th biggest site in the US right now, build a new programmatic stack from scratch um, in the process of uh, redoing this. So what we've done is we've made a huge emphasis on, on selling premium and moving up the stack. And we've done, in the fourth quarter of this year after our redesign, we, we have had an incredible success of like blue chip names that want to be with us because our content is really great, it's premium, and we can talk about that and why that's interesting. But what we've been able to do is take a programmatic stack that essentially dumped excess inventory into exchanges and move everything up. So um, we changed the way we pay people. I really believe that if you pay premium sellers to sell programmatic, people do what they're paid to do. That was a huge shift we made, and we spent a lot of time um, with our sophisticated stack getting people to run it and explaining to our sellers how to sell it. And it's been, um, it has happened way more quickly than I ever thought it would happen. So, um, so it's really been, been all good for you. It's been, it's interesting. We, it's, not, it's been all good for us because we didn't have like an unbelievably great premium business that it was taking shots at. What this, it allowed us to do was take a programmatic business and lift it up the stack. And it's really, really enhanced our ability to do premium stuff. And now we're, more than half of our revenue is now premium revenue, and that was not the case uh, And what, what about an, an established brand like, like an NBC Universal? How does that work, uh, well, Christian? Um, my knee jerk to your question was um, a different one, um, not to go straight into the ad technology end of it, but really the way we think about it is how do we enable new opportunities for consumers to consume and interact with our content. And, and that's where technology obviously has achieved a fundamentally different playing field, um, both in terms of reaching existing customers or viewers of our, uh, of our content in new places and engaging them further. Um, but also reaching new segments of audiences. I mean, we have uh, highly engaged audiences with our content on platforms that may not watch programming on the television, but that are watching it on, on different platforms. And I think that then, so if you, if you start with that and you, and, you, and you sort of look at younger demographics that are engaging with our content, whether it's sports, news, entertainment, lifestyle content, um, in younger demographics, up to 20 to 30% of the consumption and engagement with our content happens on what we all classify as digital or nonlinear platforms. And that then, I think, poses a challenge of how do you re-aggregate all of those various touch points with consumers in your content to create a value proposition for advertisers that still is compelling and hangs together. So we've invested a lot of effort, not only in programmatic technology, but just in advertising technology and content management technology that allows us to still go back to clients and agency partners and offer a 360 offering that um, transcends linear television, various digital platforms, mobile platforms, and increasingly you know, the next generation of that. So that's where we've started. And we can talk more maybe in subsequent questions about programmatic specifically, but that's where I would start. Great, thank you. Paul, Bloomberg is a company that was built on technology but Bloomberg Media, not so much. So you are a few months into this new role now. Yes. Um, what, what are you seeing uh, as the, the opportunities uh, where technology can help you uh, accelerate your goals? Yeah, I, this is an exciting time for Bloomberg Media because uh, like you mentioned, Bloomberg itself has been a digital business from day one for over 32 years. Uh, it was launched as an internet brand and a cloud brand before either of them really existed. But when you think about the media side, it's been a very traditional approach. It's been television, it's been magazines, it's been radio, and digital. But the digital has always represented about half of our business. In the recent few months, we've launched an enormous amount of technology that's, one, 
completely elevated our digital position so that we're able to target our, our content to the consumers more effectively. We've also similarly launched a nice CMS product that's going to allow us to tell our stories across all the different platforms. Where I'm excited is where ideas like programmatic are coming into play. As we introduce that for our advertisers, it gives us the opportunity to launch our premium content through, that, through a model and, and really activate our data stream. What it's done for us is somewhere in the middle of, these, of my two colleagues here. One is it's allowed us to, to elevate our content up the stack, which is super important. But what it's also given us a new thinking is not just how we activate it digitally, but how we're going to activate the programmatic equation to our non-digital assets. So, so each of you talked about content a, a little bit. Uh, but my, my question for you is that have you evolved your content uh, at the same rate that you've evolved your ad business given given technology, what effect has it really really had? Yeah, I would say that we are moving at such a fast pace in that area, it's absolutely affected every aspect of our business. The content side of it is one of the most important places for us to play a role. You know, I too am a recovering publisher and uh, I spent a lot of time in the, on the print side of it. And what, I, what I've seen it now is a more entrepreneurial spirit, especially at Bloomberg, where if you start thinking about your content and deliver it in more active ways using technology so that we build everything mobile up. Even our broadcast is built from a mobile digital perspective. That has changed everything. And then when you combine that to the advertisers, the ultimate goal we have is to do two things. One is have our editors tell the stories seamlessly across the platform to the consumers the way that they want to consume it and how our advertisers tell their stories seamlessly across our platforms the way that our, they want our consumers to interact with it. Yeah, I, so. would, I would agree with that. And, and I think that was sort of my answer to your first question, which is I actually think on the content side, there's been a ton of progress. If you think about our content, long form NBC Universal primetime shows have been available on digital platforms for eight years running. So in, in a way, the consumer and the content is ahead, and now, we're using um, those new platforms and the reach and scale that we achieve on digital platforms to actually create new content for those audiences as well. And the advertising side is the one that's actually following. But we've seen a huge leap in terms of the buy side, I think, embracing the consumption and advertising opportunities of digital platforms, not just in the way that Jason outlined it earlier from a direct response perspective, but from a brand advertiser perspective. Well, that, that's that actually, really the, yeah, that, the big shift. Th and that kind of gets into my yeah. next question, um, which is how, how has the advance of programmatic and other uh, marketing technologies changed, enhanced, damaged? What, where do you come out on what that's done to your relationships uh, on the buy side and how it's affected, affected your business? I think for us, we have a maybe a non-traditional view of this. And part of it, again, comes to where we come from. Anybody who wants to give you money any way they want to give you money because they think your content is valuable, you need to work with them on that. Unfortunately, we're, we're not driving the bus. The way we can drive the bus is we have a 1,000 experts to make fantastic content that people m must get in front of. I think our advantage is um, a lot of intent-based traffic, which is helpful, right? And intent-based traffic performs extremely well for all the different categories of buyers that Jason was outlining before. Um, and, and that's our advantage. So, so the way, because I think we had a bit of a fresh start, which is, which is a, a disadvantage, but if you look at it right, it's an advantage. Well, r remind everybody about .com so we're, is how old. Yeah, so we're, we're 18 years old. Um, we have three and a half million pieces of content. Uh, our content is created by a thousand topic specific experts in health and food and all these other channels. And I think for, for a long time we were treated like an encyclopedia, like we are the answer to what you're searching for. I think what we are now treating it as is we are actually premium content that helps you solve problems. Just because our content is evergreen, um, if you want to make barbecue sauce, it needs to look beautiful and be beautiful. And it turns out that advertisers really respond to that. And to, to bring it back around to your question, frankly, we don't care how they want to respond to that. It, we don't care how they want to buy things. We just need to give them um, what they want in the medium in which they want to buy it. And it means we need to understand all these mediums. And I think, again, because we don't have to retrain people, we can bring in new people. It's been a really great um, You don't have to retrain your own staff, you're Correct. saying. OK, Correct. Not, not retraining on the buy side. Um, you know, I think we're not trying to retrain the buy side. I think the, the thing we're trying to Somebody's retrain Somebody's got to. Well, again, if they. <laughs> Look, I'd be happy to not retrain them because I would love to sell like giant native programs that we execute through IOs at 
you know, $80 CPMs. That's frankly not uh, what's happening. So um, our job is to know what they're talking about and lead them to where we want to go. I mean, let me just add a couple of things to that. I, I totally agree with you, and I think that's right. We don't really want to change the buy side, really. What we want to do is understand what they're trying to get at. And programmatic is a wonderful tool that puts a lot of analytics and a lot of uh, buyer needs in the same hands. And it actually, from a buyer perspective, is a great value play because it allows them to take inventory and, and add more value to their client, which is something that every agency is trying to fight for right now. And I actually think that's pretty important. What I think is a, what's really important as a publisher is all of these things are just simply tools. Once you layer back and you start to understand from a client's perspective, what is it that you're trying to achieve and how is programmatic playing a role? Why are some advertisers shifting 75% of the revenue to a programmatic buying equation? What they're trying to do is to try to, one, become more efficient, two, empower their data products, three, is to have better analytics tools, and four, create more value from the inventory they're buying as they're, uh, as they're achieving it. So as a publisher, our goal is to accelerate that. Similar to the conversations we've all been having around native. It's like there's been a lot of debates on good, bad, and different. The bottom line is what advertisers need to do is to tell a great story. We have to give them the tools to be able to do that. And they need to buy inventory that's going to reach those consumers with the greatest effective rate. We need to be able to give them the tools to do that. Once we partner with them on that equation, we all actually win. And we talked a lot about the tools have changed, the vocabulary's changed, but People want the same thing. They want, to, they want right. their ads to do something. Yeah. They have an objective they have to hit, and we have to help them hit it. And um, look, we don't have as much leverage in the market now as these guys have. So if somebody wants to do something their way, we need to figure out how to do it their way and our way. And that's the, that's the trick for us. Exactly. I, I would take, I mean, I, I agree with everything that Paul, Paul said as well. Um, I would take a slightly different spin. We're not there to educate and change the buy side, but I, what we are finding is that even with new technology tools like programmatic platforms, there is still a very involved and intelligent conversation that's required about how you meet marketers' objectives with the offerings that we bring to bear. Well, I th and, and I think that's that's. It's not, not just connecting two well platforms, understood. right? It's that, it's really we're not, not just eliminating all people from right. from the equation. Well, you I mean you may in the end end up with more efficient processes to conduct business, but as with everything in the early phase, the setup of what are the brands trying to achieve? And by the way, there are big portfolio advertisers that have hundreds of brands that have different objectives. And, and they sometimes have a stated corporate um, strategy that says we're all in on programmatic. But that might actually differ very, very um, uh, starkly by brand. So in fact, the brand manager conversation is, is, is another important one in, in that as well. And they're having increasing influence over how programmatic and other types of marketing is, 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 is acquired. So what we're finding long story short, is that while programmatic may improve um, process efficiency um, in terms of how you engage with a client or an agency upfront, not necessarily in the upfront marketplace, but to begin with, is highly involved. And you need subject matter experts and, and real intelligence behind that. Because often, the buy side has been driven by technology platforms or other stakeholders. And it really needs a dialogue between the media owner and the, 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 the brand, ultimately. And that's where we're finding more affinity and, and, and more of a bingo mo moment, ultimately. It's marrying the power that brand advertisers have seen in content and context for decades with audience-enabled buying. And that's really the marriage that we're trying to So, so you're really very, out. very much with Paul in terms of this is, this is a tool. Paul, you know, I, I, I look at you, and, and you ran for so many, many years some of the most iconic brands uh, in in the content space at, at mm -hmm. Time Inc. Have you surprised yourself with your um, with your understanding and belief that that programmatic is great? Because a lot of publishers are still living in in fear that you know this is Armageddon for them. But you you've come around very very quickly. So I've rehabbed. <laughs> you rehabbed. I, I went on a sixty day program. You know, in, interesting enough, and uh, I. I don't work for Time Inc. any longer. I did for a very long time, so I can't speak for them. But that's been an area that, uh, as the chief revenue officer of Time Inc. and publisher of many of the brands, we spent a lot of time thinking about programmatic at that time also, because uh, it was something that we saw emerging. Really, in real time, what, I'm, what, I, what I notice now, and this is the part that I get super excited about for being in this position that I'm in right now, is that um, these are, you know, with every tool, 
there's, there are people who understand how to activate the tool and then ultimately know how to bring value to the client. And that's where a lot of great agencies and clients are doing su superb work in the programmatic space. Then there are others that are, that are following it or chasing it because they read about it in the press and they think that's the most important new buzzword and they need to put that into their plan. You know, it's back when, you know, there was a, an adage I read that, you know, no one got fired for recommending social media a couple years ago. And, and it's like, it's true. You, did, you didn't because you felt like you had to put in a plan to make it make sense. Well, those kind of that, that check the box thing. So check the box. Yeah. But those that actually knew how to utilize it well, delivered. And the same thing here with programmatic. So as a publisher who's watched over premium brands for a very long time, I can tell you that there's, uh, I don't believe in any risk for any of these new buying behaviors to uh, what we do. I don't believe there's any risk to, to, for our ability to deliver premium content to a consumer. And I absolutely see no risk for advertisers to engage with us in any way, shape they want to buy. Where I do see the risk is the misuse of any of these tools, which as a premium publisher, that's the one thing we want to safeguard. But frankly, I see this as more of an opportunity than anything. So just sort of in, in, in general, given the combination of this, this volume and velocity of change that, that we are uh, experiencing. What, how do you sort of rank the, the, the biggest challenges uh, in our industry? What, what do we really need? Uh, and again, very broadly speaking, what areas do we need to focus on that are absolutely critical, uh, critical to growth? I mean, I think Jason's slide there, that, that horrible homepage, um, you know, when people ask you, well, what's holding back growth? Performances like that, I mean, I mean that, that scares people. Well, yeah. What are the things that we need, need to address? And I, I can only speak for what our challenges are. And um, our number one challenge is people, actually. There okay. are- People as in pe talent. It's people as in talent. Okay. Um, to, um, and some of the challenges are ours, and some of the challenges, selfishly, I wish other people had better people doing these things. Um, being, it's a, it's a, in many ways, it's a Wall Street trader mindset. In many ways, it's like a real estate broker mindset. And in many ways, it's a brand manager mindset. And it's, there are not very many people that understand how the stack works as well as how to talk to other human beings. And we, um, it's true, it's true. You, you're laughing because it's true. Um, the, the number one challenge is, is um, making this a, a, a really interesting appealing thing for talented people to work in who otherwise may be going and doing something else. Um, and um, organizations like ours, and I think we've done a decent job of this, treating this as sort of like a first line job, not a second line job. Like these aren't the guys that, that you talk to at the end of the meeting, they are on equal footing at the meeting. And if that can happen, it would go a really long way uh, to helping us. Look, I, I've said this before, I think that there's, on, on the publisher side, there's. 50 people in the world that can do a really good job of running a programmatic business for any publisher of scale. Um, that's not that many. We could use some more. Yeah, and we could actually use more buyers who look at it as a, uh, a way to work with the smallest of publishers as well as the largest. I mean, there is a part of one of the trends that I worry about is uh, agencies engaging with just the, uh, it, with, with the programmatic products and the stacks that have the largest amount of inventory. And, and we're and definitely think, seeing that a as a trend. I mean, you've all heard it. It's, you know, we want to deal with larger but fewer publishers. Right, and that's a risk, especially with a tool like this, because I actually see this as a really valuable tool for some of the smaller, most premium places. Um, so, you know, as an industry advocate, which I am, I believe that we have to, one, recruit more talent to our industry who understands how to use these data analytics. And two is we have to encourage all of our buying partners to, util to look at the vastness of the industry and the opportunity within the total industry as opposed to just scale. Sean, where, where do you come out on, on the, the broad challenges? I, that we I really agree need with this. I think, I think people are an ingredient to that, but I would, I would, I think, I would color it as complex reduction of complexities is required, and, and, and in many different ways. And it's not just technological complexity. It is. Um, what Neil was talking about as well, how do we intelligently articulate a value proposition between a content provider and a, and a, and a brand? And the simplicity of that value proposition is really important. And, we, and we've never been good at that as an industry. I think we- That's right. It, at, at the very beginning, I feel like we delighted in complicating the complicated. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then we made it more complicated on top of that well, complicated. So where it cycles back to people, just to your point, is you need people that can actually 
look at something that is highly complex and head exploding at times or at you know, all times of the day and reduce it to a, a very simple form of go-to-market strategy, value proposition, articulation, and points that we can take to you know, a thousand plus salespeople that we have in our company so that they can all intelligently speak about this in the marketplace. We, we used to have a strategy at our company and at many other companies where programmatic was a, its own silo, it had its own compensation plan, its own sales team, and they were out you know, calling on trading desks to sell inventory. We have a fundamentally different strategy at this point. Um, you know, we've really invested in programmatic as a capability as part of a broader portfolio offering, and we're enabling our entire sales team, not just digital sellers, but television sellers and in the future cross-platform sellers, to talk about that as one of the major and important parts of their offerings. Yeah, sure, they, pro they, they, we all launched it as part of a, a total toolkit, yeah. right, right? Which is awesome. Yeah. But you know, it, it's interesting because programmatic itself, it, you know, we have succeeded in really complicating that. I mean, it, I don't know how many panels there were during advertising week. On, on programmatic, it was astonishing. And then people are appending uh, other words, oh, that's native programmatic. You know, <laughs> I wanna shoot myself. You know, it, what? We have manual programmatic, I heard. You have manual, oh, right. Right. manual. Neil, you have anything special? Yes, uh, but I think awesome. the, the one thing is, look, there's, and this has been proven in every market in, in history, there is margin in market imperfections. There's margin in asymmetric information. There's margin in friction. and. And um, advertising doesn't necessarily want to be sold with the same sort of friction and asymmetric information it used to be. If you have great, great content and people need to be there, it's like the bond market. You've got the bond, everybody wants to buy it, you can charge what you want. But at the end of the day, when, when you're a scaled player in the market, you can't fight the move towards more perfect information. You have to embrace it. It is your friend, not your enemy, but it's a scary, scary thing. Okay, lightning round. Last question. Um, what is your one prediction for programmatic in the next 12 months? Uh, I absolutely see it growing. I see it becoming more important, but I actually see it migrating cross-platform to include all the different media platforms in addition to what we're doing digitally. Okay, so you see this, this coming to television, radio, outdoor, I do. et cetera. I would say in an ironic way, it actually helps swing the pendulum back to high quality content and audience environments. And we're definitely seeing that in, 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 in Fantastic in irony. I'll say two things. One, my prediction is we have the same panel next year. That's one. And, <laughs> and, uh, well, because that's what we do. Uh, two, I, I actually, and panels aren't that much fun when everybody agrees, but I agree. What, what programmatic <laughs> is doing is highlighting people who have really great content and uh, allowing those content owners to differentiate from things um, that are sold in a commodity way. It's a little bit reversed to what I think a lot of people think are happening. Yeah. I, I actually view this as very, very good. Yeah. Wow, I, I don't usually like to moderate panels where everyone agrees with each other either. Um, I usually tell the panelists beforehand, if you do that, I will leave the stage. Um, and that makes for a very interesting <laughs> end of the conversation. But. Um, but I think we, we did cover uh, a lot of ground very quickly uh, in a half an hour this morning. Um, and it's been wonderful to be with you, and thank you all. Thank you.